Welcome to a special edition of the CEC report, which is called Revive the Spirit of Westphalia to Stop World War III. I'm Elisa Barwick. Now, this presentation was actually recorded two years ago at the end of 2012, but is actually even more relevant today because of the precipice of global war we are on between Russia and the United States, potentially. Hi, I'm Elisa Barwick. Welcome to a CEC report special edition. Today we're going to take a look at the planet from a historical perspective. We're going to talk about the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia and its significance for today. This was the treaty that ended the Thirty Years' War and brought about the age of nation states, incredibly crucial institutions, which we tend to take for granted today. But first I would like to pose a question. Do you think that we as a nation have the right to make our own decisions? Or do you think that some other nation or nations should be allowed to stick their nose in at any juncture and tell us what to do? That simple right for us to determine our own destiny is the basis of sovereignty, the principle perhaps most under attack in the world today. Why is it under attack? Well, when you take a quick survey of the globe, you see that it is rife with wars and conflicts. And we have an upsurge in lawlessness and in the growth of terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda. You begin to wonder whether it is possible to continue to have nations with governments or if we will end up with a host of various territories under the ever-changing control of marauding, lawless gangs. Some parties think that only with a global force monitoring nations and dictating terms can we ever achieve peace. This force intervenes with regime change operations, themselves ironically often based upon bolstering local opposition movements comprised of groups like Al-Qaeda. The CEC has always taken a position of defending the sovereign right of each and every nation to determine their own destiny, whether that nation be Australia or Syria or anything in between. That same right is being defended by Russia and China when they have voted against various UN resolutions calling for Western interventions into nations like Syria. They also know that they are the ultimate target of this series of coup d'etats. So Russia and China are being bullied to drop their resistance to regime change by nations which are pushing to destroy the notion of sovereignty in favour of an idea championed by Tony Blair for more than a decade, the responsibility to protect, or R2P. This means that in the case of governments believed to have committed mass atrocities against their population, the international community has the responsibility to protect those citizens. Sounds good on the surface, but let's have a closer look at where this doctrine came from. From the intervention in Kosovo in 1999 to the 2003 invasion of Iraq, Blair steeled the spines of US leaders insisting that national sovereignty was a thing of the past. He asserted that the era of the nation state, ushered in with the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia, was over. In a March 5, 2004 speech justifying the invasion of Iraq, he laid this out explicitly. Let me attempt for you an explanation of how my own thinking, as a political leader, has evolved during these past few years. Already before September the 11th, the world's view of the justification of military action had been changing. The only clear case in international relations, traditionally, for armed intervention had been self-defense, response to aggression. But the notion of intervening on humanitarian grounds had been gaining currency. I set this out following the Kosovo War in a speech in Chicago in 1999, where I called for what I termed a doctrine of international community, where in certain clear circumstances, we do intervene, even though we are not directly threatened. So for me, 
Before September the 11th, I was already reaching for a different philosophy in international relations from a traditional one that has held sway since the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. Namely, that a country's internal affairs are for it. You don't interfere unless it threatens you or breaches a treaty or triggers an obligation of alliance. Well, 9-11 certainly gave him the go-ahead. Another figure who came out after 9-11, demanding the end of the Westphalian era, was National Security Advisor and Secretary of State under Nixon and Ford, Henry Kissinger. He wrote in the fall 2002 NPQ magazine that the controversy about preemption, at bottom, it is a debate between the traditional notion of sovereignty of the nation state as set forth in the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 and the adaption required by both modern technology and the nature of the terrorist threat. The main funder of US President Obama's election, the international financier George Soros, is the other key figure who has long been promoting R2P. In a January 2004 article in Foreign Policy magazine, Soros stated that sovereignty is an anachronistic concept originating in bygone times when society consisted of rulers and subjects, not citizens. It became the cornerstone of international relations with the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. The rulers of a sovereign state have a responsibility to protect the state's citizens. When they fail to do so, the responsibility is transferred to the international community. The R2P doctrine was formally proposed at the United Nations in 2005 and has been heavily pushed ever since. However, it has never been accepted as international law by the UN. Even after a lengthy debate in July 2009, only a rather weak resolution to continue to consider the doctrine was passed. The non-aligned movement of 118 members and 18 observer nations opposed the R2P concept as a danger to national sovereignty and a tool of selective punishment. So at the moment, Article 2.4 of Chapter 1 of the United Nations Charter, which lays out the purpose and principles of the United Nations, still says that all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. And its charter further states that the UN is based on the principle of the sovereign equality of all of its members. Despite this, member nations continue to essentially break international law. After the break, we'll take a look at the growing opposition to this R2P doctrine. If you've just joined us, we're talking about the principle of sovereignty being destroyed in favour of certain developed nations that is Britain and America, inevitably joined by Australia, being encouraged to interfere on purportedly humanitarian grounds. Fortunately, there is opposition to this. At the UN on February 22, 2012, India's permanent representative to the UN, Hardeep Singh Puri, citing the use of the R2P by over-enthusiastic members of the international community in the case of Libya, and Syria, charged that the UN principle of responsibility to protect is being used for regime change. He is correct. The R2P was explicitly the justification for Obama's Libya war and the assassination of that country's leader, Muammar Gaddafi, in 2011. Special Assistant to Obama and Soros Lackey, Samantha Power, has pushed R2P, even writing the foreword to a 2009 book, Responsibility to Protect the Global Moral Compact for the 21st Century, 
which was the blueprint for R2P interventions. The success of the Libya operation is now viewed by Soros and his cohorts as the greatest chance in a century to wipe the idea of sovereignty out of the charters of the United Nations and out of the world. On September 27, 2012, on the occasion of receiving the credentials of 21 new ambassadors to Russia, President Vladimir Putin demanded that the international community reject, quote, geopolitical gains and not allow the use of force in circumvention of the UN Charter. Putin called for reflecting on the UN Charter, which, quote, sets forth the principles for collectively managing international relations and establishing a fair and just world order that respects all countries' sovereignty and equality. These principles guide us to settle all problems through negotiations without resorting to outside intervention. Strict adherence to these principles is needed more than ever today. The supremacy of law should be as guaranteed in the international arena as it is within countries themselves. This directly concerns events taking place in the world's hotspots, he said, above all in the Middle East and North Africa. Various forms of instigation and continued violence with the aim of forcing regime change will only drive the situation into a dead end. Violence breeds only more violence. In a lengthy TV interview on September 6, 2012 on Russia Today, President Putin had gotten even more specific, addressing the insanity of US efforts to oust regimes by fostering opposition movements comprised of Al-Qaeda networks. He said, You know, whenever someone aspires to attain a much desired end, any means will do. As a rule, they will try and do that by hook or by crook and hardly ever think of the consequences that will follow. That was the case during the Afghan war after the Soviet Union in 1979 sent its troops to Afghanistan. At that time, our current partners supported a rebel movement there and basically gave rise to Al-Qaeda, a United States pet project that later targeted its creator. Today, some people want to use militants from Al-Qaeda or some other organisations with equally radical views to accomplish their goals in Syria. This policy is dangerous and very short-sighted. But in that case, one should unlock Guantanamo, arm all of its inmates and bring them to Syria to do the fighting. It's practically the same kind of people. What Putin is pointing to here is the fact that the bloody circumstances that supposedly compel the international community to intervene to protect the people of certain nations do not generally arise spontaneously. They are deliberately created, as was also the case during the Thirty Years' War. This in turn sets up the justification for a virtually global empire to be created with a global police force monitoring and intervening to, uh, to dislodge undesirable governments wherever necessary. Disunity and turmoil are fostered via the age-old mechanism of the British Empire, sometimes called divide and conquer, and is why the concept of the Treaty of Westphalia, based on the advantage of the other, is crucial today. If your foreign policy is motivated by putting other nations, even your enemies, first, then you can't be played off against each other. And within your own nation, you will tend to be unified rather than divided. On the other hand, where we have seen the principle of R2P in action, has it really worked? For millions of Iraqis, Libyans and Afghanis, the quality of life is much worse than it was before. In these countries, there is effectively no functional or unified government, perhaps apart from in name only. Just marauding ruling gangs in various regions at worst, or disparate militia zones at best. Here in Australia, there is no doubt that we pretty much take government for granted, especially given how much we all whinge about whichever happens to be the current one. Well, it's a pretty crucial institution though, even if it ain't working so good at the moment. But a government can only really function if it has the authority to make decisions and follow through on those decisions without interference. 
that is, if it has sovereignty. After the break, we'll take a closer look at the Treaty of Westphalia and how revolutionary it was. Welcome back. So we're discussing the Treaty of Westphalia and the institution of the sovereign nation state, which is under threat today. The Peace of Westphalia was the treaty that finally brought an end to the Thirty Years' War, which raged from 1618 to 1648 between nominally Catholic and Protestant states of Europe. The war had been a never-ending cycle of violence, driven by religious zeal on both sides, in which all sides felt justified in exacting revenge and invading their neighbours to defend communities of their own religious persuasion. After 30 years, Europe was decimated, but there was no end in sight until the Catholic Cardinal Mazarin brokered an extraordinary peace agreement wherein both sides gave up their decades of grievances on a truly Christian basis, which was the advantage of the other. Both sides signed knowing that by doing so it would advantage their enemy, but in the knowledge that their enemy was signing on the same basis. The Peace of Westphalia enshrined the principle of non-interference as the foundation of national sovereignty. No longer could a prince use claims of religious oppression of fellow Catholics or Protestants in a neighbouring state as an excuse to attack that state. How did Mazarin pull this off? Well, there were no nation states at the time. The Habsburg Emperor in the area of Europe, Europe we now call Germany, had feudal authority over small warring states manipulated against each other using religious means. Relations with neighbouring countries were poor and conflict with Spain, France and the Dutch Republic, etc., was also constant. Mazarin, who was French and the envoy of P Pope Urban VIII, acted as a mediator and conspired to bring about peace and sovereignty by developing the general welfare of the German people, by developing, for their greatest advantage, the cities located at the mouths of or along the major rivers, which formed the basis of commerce and trade. In this way, war-torn regions of the empire could be rescued and rebuilt and the British-Dutch mercantile control unravelled. An example of such control was the privately exacted and outrageously expensive tolls to use rivers, like the Rhine and the Danube, for transport. Under Mazarin's proposals, tolls were to become illegal. Mazarin conducted a thorough study of the entire Habsburg Empire river system and composed a plan for economic development corridors. This would open up channels of trade with many more neighbouring countries. With thousands of jobs being created, new towns springing up and new markets becoming accessible, this also fostered the power of the individual to participate in the economy and in the state. Mazarin's proposal included an economic policy of protection and directed public credit aimed to create sovereign nation states co-designed by his great protégé, Jean-Baptiste Colbert. Colbert's dirigist policy of fair trade was the most effective weapon against the liberal free trade policy of central banking maritime powers of the British and Dutch oligarchies. By the time a number of electors and princes of the warring German states began to realise that Mazarin's project was entirely to their advantage, and decided to modify their allegiance to the emperor, war had reduced the German people from 21 million to only 13 million as of 1648. Without peace, European civilization was going to be destroyed. The treaty was signed by the Holy Roman Emperor and the King of France and their respective allies after several years of negotiations. It succeeded both because of the benefits from economic cooperation which it promised, given that it was based on the common good of all the people, and also because, unlike most treaties, it wasn't based upon drawing lines in the sand that if crossed by one or the other party would unfurl the gates of war again. 
The only principle which can put a dead stop to suspicion between two age-old enemies is the principle of the advantage of the other because you are putting the other party ahead of yourself, giving him the advantage and not demanding any compensation in return. It works because what is good for him is ultimately good for you. Let's have a look at two of the most important concepts in the treaty. Article 1 begins, A Christian, general and permanent peace and true and honest friendship must rule. And this peace must be so honest and seriously guarded and nourished that, that each part furthers the advantage, honour and benefit of the other. A faithful neighbourliness should be renewed and flourish for peace and friendship and flourish again. Peace among sovereign nations requires, in other words, that each nation develops itself fully and regards it as its self-interest to develop the others fully and vice versa, a real family of nations. Article 2 says, on both sides all should be forever forgotten and forgiven. What has from the beginning of the unrest, no matter how or where, from one side or the other, happened in terms of hostility, so that neither because of that nor for any other reason or pretext should anyone commit or allow to happen any hostility, unfriendliness, difficulty or obstacle in respect to persons, their status, goods or security itself or through others, secretly or openly, directly or indirectly, under the pretense of the authority of the law or by way of violence within the kingdom or anywhere outside of it. And any earlier contradictory treaties should not stand against this. Instead, the fact that each and every one from one side and the other, both before and during the war, committed insults, violent acts, hostilities, damages and injuries without regard of persons or outcomes should be completely put aside so that everything, whatever one could demand from one another under his name, will be forgotten to eternity. The Peace of Westphalia thereby established a code of nations which was based on the Christian principle that all men are created equal in the eyes of God. Applied to foreign policy, this meant helping neighbouring peoples and nations according to their economic needs, not for the interests of one's own nation. This is the notion of the common good. Mazarin instituted this new code of government contact, conduct for the purpose of population growth and for the advancement of scientific, technological and cultural development of all nations of the world, with the conscious intention of increasing proportionately the power of mankind over the universe. This image of man is the very basis of the sovereign nation state and international relations between nation states. It is that image of man which we are sacrificing if we give up the notion and the practice of sovereignty. Only the spirit of cooperation, as seen in the Treaty of Westphalia, can break the world from the fast track it is now on to thermonuclear confrontation. As in the case of the Treaty of Westphalia, that cooperation must be based on an urgent, mutually desirable mission to secure our peace and safety into the future. Thanks for tuning in to the CEC report. Join us again next week and don't forget to call in for more information, particularly a copy of our latest New Citizen newspaper. Mm -hmm.